White and the government co-chair, Jose Arrieta. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Arrieta. I'm Mark White with Deloitte. Uh, you know, first of all, we are extremely proud of the turnout we had today and the interest that we've had in, in blockchain. Uh, and I just want to kind of share a story with you about how this came about. Um, I went to ActiX Management of Change, and I had a conversation with Todd Hager and Frederick. And uh, we, talked, we talked a little bit about blockchain. I said, guys, we should really hold a conference on this where industry and government can get together and talk about the benefits of blockchain and get an understanding of what it is in a safe environment. And, and that single conversation led to a couple of meetings uh, and to an event with over 250 people. So we're, we're quite proud of that and we're quite thankful for all of your interest. So uh, before we get started, I, I want to thank the sponsors today, uh, the, the planning committee, uh, and that was a manifold planning committee. I, I think that ACT IAC do a great job in bringing both industry and government to the table but not just by, uh, by lip service. It's actually a large group of people involved in planning what you'll experience today. So when you see one, uh, you should thank them. Particularly thanking the sponsors from a Title I standpoint, Deloitte and Sapient. From a, sure. <laughs> uh, from a Title II standpoint, Booz Allen Hamilton are here. And also from an event sponsorship, Macro Solutions and Prometheus Computing are here. We'd also like to thank the volunteers, and, and I'm, I'm going to name a few. Uh, Komiz Abdul Rahimi from the United States Treasury, Jessica Reiner from the United States Treasury. Yeah, here, here. And, and Andrew Vinjani from the General Services Administration, and, and Sandy Barsky from the General Services Administration. They were kind of the first folks, besides Todd and Frederick, that kind of jumped on the train and said, We want to help with this. Great. So they tell me we have some housekeeping notes. First, this is vendor neutral, uh, despite all the vendor names we just, we just listed off. Um, it is also on the record, so press or present. Um, we'll be sending a short uh, survey, uh, outline an online survey after this, and we really appreciate your feedback on that so that uh, when and if we do this again, based on where you guide us, that it will be valuable to you. So uh, we're tweeting today, and it's, it's at actiac no hyphen, at act IAC, so to tweet away. And, and for the government folks, you do get four CLPs for this, uh, and we encourage you, I was told not to use the word disruptive, but we encourage you to take the knowledge that you learn here today and be disruptive uh, within your agencies as it relates to this technology. Disruptive government, is that not a good thing? I, I, I don't know, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to introduce the keynote this morning, um, and, and frankly, Chairman Giancarlo doesn't need much introduction in his current role as Chairman of the U.S. Commodities Future Trading Commission, uh, not so long ago confirmed in the role, though practicing in that. Perhaps more interesting to you and unknown to me is that he hails from the New Jersey area, um, in, in actual Jersey City, the garden spot of the East Coast. So uh, Skidmore for the undergraduate, and then um, we, he came here and Vanderbilt for his law degree uh, and transnational law and president of the law school's International Law Society, taking the, uh, the law degree and practicing, not only as a practicing attorney, serving the high-tech community, bringing high-tech businesses into being, but himself then moving into that business and becoming an operational officer in a high-tech company. Um, before he actually entered public service relatively recently is in a long distinguished career. So with that, I would ask you to welcome to the podium for our inter uh, introductory remarks, Chairman Giancarlo. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody this morning? Um, the coffee is right over there, and if somewhere in the middle of my talk you feel the urge, don't hesitate to get up. But I'm going to try to do my best no, to make, not have to send you there too often this morning. Um, and my thanks to Mark White uh, for that warm introduction, and also to Government Chair Jose Arreta. Uh, thank you very much. And also I'm grateful to, um, to ACT-IAC, uh, which plays a critical role in advancing public-private partnerships. 
and also thanks to this year's uh, government co-chair of the U.S. Treasury uh, for hosting today's program and to the sponsors as well. It's hard to think of a more timely subject than, than that one of this conference titled the 2017 Blockchain Forum. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to kick the day off, share, share with you some of the CFT's thinking regarding how we're trying to keep pace and facilitate market enhancing innovation. And I'm also gonna provide some thoughts uh, in the blockchain space. But I actually wanted to start um, just with a little bit of a story um, that for me at least crystallized the transformative nature um, of how exponential digital technologies are really changing virtually everything around us. And, and I'll actually put my notes aside for a second. It actually begins uh, with a trip I made to uh, Ellis County, Texas, which is about an hour south of Dallas um, in the spring of 2016. And I was there, uh, the CFTC uh, is the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and its historic roots are in the ag commodity space. Our agency was founded about 40 years ago. It came out of the USDA and it was formed primarily to look after ag commodities and make sure those markets were free of manipulation. Well, over the decades, our, um, our jurisdiction has grown tremendously. And in fact, the markets have grown direct, uh, tremendously for financial uh, derivative products. And now today, only about 10% of our oversight is in the ag commodity space. They only, the ag commodities only make up about 10% of the, the markets we oversee, and yet they're very important in their own right, but we report to our ag committees in both the House and Senate, so they're 100% of our political base and our support base in Congress, so it's very important uh, that notwithstanding the fact that they make up 10% of the market oversee, they have to occupy an enormous amount of our time uh, because we serve uh, under the oversight of, of folks in Congress that are focused on ag issues. So it's been very important to me uh, as a commissioner and now as chairman to make sure I understand those ag commodity markets. And being, as uh, Mark mentioned, from northern New Jersey, it's, it, while we are the Garden State, of course, I didn't grow up on a farm. I don't have a lot of firsthand experience certainly with cotton, and there's been some issues in our cotton futures contract, and I wanted to go to Texas to meet with a cotton farmer and understand how cotton is produced. So, long and short is, I'm in Bardwell, Texas, with Bob Beakley, a Texas farmer, and we're riding in his truck, and it is about April of 2016, and we go past a field, it's not a cotton field, it's a field though that's clearly just been cut, and I said to Farmer Beakley, I said, uh, that field looks like it was cut, but when did you cut it? And um, I guess I was thinking, it's April, why are they cutting a field in April? And he said, oh, that's winter wheat, we cut it last night. And then we drive along a few more minutes and actually kind of being slow on the take, I said, you cut it last night? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I know enough about farming to know you don't cut fields at night. And he said, oh no, we cut it last night. He said, you wanna see something cool? He pulls the truck over to the side of the road, he takes out his iPhone, he gives it a couple of swipes and he shows me a scene. And at first I thought it was pitch black, but in the scene I could actually see four headlights. And I said, well, what's this? And he explained to me that two of the headlights were his combine, which was cutting the wheat. The other two headlights were his tractor, which was riding alongside the combine. And as he further explained it, he, he said, the, the combine is being guided by GPS satellite. The tractor is being held alongside of it by vehicle telemetry. His son was in the combine, he was in the tractor, and the whole scene was being filmed by his drone. <laughs> and I thought about it, and I flew back to Washington the next day, and as I was reflecting, I was thinking about farming, an occupation that's been on, on, you know, going on on Earth as long as humans have been on this Earth, has always been a daylight activity. And now, because of digital precision, uh, precision positioning through satellites, it can now be done 24 seven, and it can be done by two men in the middle of the night. Farming is now a 24 hour a day activity. But that's just one aspect of what's now called precision farming. It's not just the ability to position and, and to do without light, but to be able to plant and cut fields to such accuracy 
um, that, that they, the, the, the ability to get every inch of soil utilized properly is gone to extraordinary dimensions. And actually, in, in other visits that I've now made as, 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 at the commission, I've actually been able to visit John Deere's uh, skunk works where they develop new type of precision farming technology. Now farmers' fields are so precise, not just the rows, but also the depth into the ground. The machinery as it's traveling over the field is actually measuring the soil and measuring it for lime content, for moisture content, for nitrogen, and then uh, putting the rows and the, and, the, and the seed in the ground just so precisely. So the long and short of it is precision farming has transformed farming. It, around the year 1900, the average farmer produced enough food for about 16 people. By 2000, because of new fertilization and the mechanization of farming, the average farmer can feed about 150 people. In the last 20 years alone, farming is now reaching, average farmer can feed about 250 people. And if you think about the population of the earth in the next, by, by 2050, it's gonna grow by another 2 billion people to about almost, uh, no, I think 9.6 billion. The precision farming is gonna enable the feeding of that additional earth's population. So farming, an activity that is as old as mankind, is going through a digital revolution. Two men the beak, on the 6,000 acre Beakley farm can use precision equipment to, uh, to, to produce their farm and they can afford that type of technology. So what does that have to do with financial markets? Well, if two men on a 6,000 acre farm can afford that type of technology, think about what's going on in our financial markets where the resources to use this type of technology are much, much greater. And that's exactly what's happened. Our financial markets are absolutely being transformed by exponential digital technology. You know, the, the most famous representation of my agency, the CFTC, is in a movie, I think from the 1980s, called Trading Places. I'm sure many people have seen it, with Eddie Murphy. And, and the markets, those markets there, the commodity markets, there are markets where you've got all these humans on the floor, hooting and hollering and yelling and using hand signals. That's the marketplace that people think about a market, and yet that's not our market anymore. Those human pits are clo long closed. Our markets are virtual, they're electronic, they're driven by algorithms. They're not human markets anymore. We'll talk a little bit in my, in my prepared remarks in a moment about some of these technologies, how they're changing markets, but the point I wanna leave you with, farming's been digitized. Finance and markets have been digitized. Everything's been digitized. Everything you do, the, you know, the way you hail a cab, the way you travel, everything's been digitized. The one thing that hasn't yet been digitized is regulation. We're still very much an analog regulator of digital markets, and that's, that drives our interest in technology. We have to become, those of us that are in the regu in re our regulators, we have to become digital regulators for digital marketplaces. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. The transformation of the markets that are taking place all around us and the need for us as regulators and as policy makers to catch up to that digital transformation and to use technology in the same way that marketplaces are using technology in order to be more productive, more efficient. So as I said, uh, current exponential digital technology is changing the world, every bit of it, especially in financial markets. Automated trading now constitutes up to 70% of regulated futures markets that we oversee at the CFTC. Automated trading now makes up 80% of cash equities markets and over 70% of foreign exchange spot markets. And it will continue to increasingly be utilized and dominate trading with new and innovative developments far into the future. These and other emerging technologies and innovations present novel regulatory opportunities, challenges, and risks. They include big data capability to enable more sophisticated data analysis and interpretation. Artificial intelligence. I mentioned farming. Artificial intelligence. John Deere, the tractor company, just bought an AI firm in Silicon Valley that will enable farmers to use um, uh, uh, robots to go through fields and identify weeds and then spray them with insecticide that's calibrated to those weeds 
and then use artificial intelligence to determine what other type of weed pro uh, may grow in the area. And they can spray them specifically on the weed and not on the rest of the crop. It's just absolutely incredible. Artif and we're seeing artificial intelligence now being deployed quite extensively in our financial markets. And then smart contracts, which can value themselves and calculate payments automatically in real time. And behavioral biometrics that can detect and combat online fraud. I've heard recently about an Israeli company that actually uses a biometric uh, tool to be able to identify keystroke behavior on any computer anywhere in the world. Each one of us have a unique keystroke methodology, the, the pressure we put, the way we use the keyboard, and this technology can now measure it, and if you log on anywhere in the world on any computer, can identify who it is. We're seeing that in our financial markets as well. And of course, then last but not least, distributed ledger and blockchain technologies that are going to tra uh, challenge orthodoxies that are foundational to today's financial market infrastructure. So our world is changing. Our parents' financial markets are gone. And this 21st century digital transformation is well underway. And that technology genie won't go back in the bottle, nor should it. We regulators can no longer be analog actors in today's digital world. So given this context, given this background, I was pleased to announce in May of this year the launch of something new at our agency, and that is something called Lab CFTC. And it's under the leadership of Dan Gorfine, our recently appointed Chief Information Officer. Lab CFTC is the focal point of our efforts to facilitate market-enhancing fintech innovation and fair competition for the benefit of the American public. And it's designed to keep pace with technological innovation. And it supports what I believe is America's vital national interest in maintaining the world's deepest, most durable, most competitive, most vibrant capital and risk transfer markets in today's algorithmic digital world. Now we've housed this initiative within our Office of General Counsel. And we did that because we believe the work while extensively dealing with technology, at heart, is essentially a legal process. That is, it's about managing the interface between technological innovation and regulatory modernization in our existing rules and regulations. Our lab CFTC is designed to make us more accessible to fintech innovators. It serves as a platform to inform us and inform our understanding of emergent technologies and how they square with existing law. But it's also designed to create a bit of a dynamic tension between innovation and what we do. We want innovators knocking on our door. We want innovators saying, we're trying to do the following. We want to use technology to do this, but your rules prevent us from doing it. Or your rules make us do something that's not well designed for the market, that's not what we're trying to do. How can we work with you to do that? And that makes sense because our rules were not designed for these technologies. In fact, our rules were designed for markets that don't exist anymore, and we need to update them. And the way to update them is to have this healthy tension with technology. So our lab CFTC will accomplish the mission we've set for it through three primary uh, prongs. The first is thoughtful engagement with innovators, whether those innovators are a disruptive startup or an established incumbent. And we want to do that so they can thrive and succeed. Secondly, is to understand how these new technologies can help make us more efficient and more effective so we can thrive and succeed. And then thirdly, we want to do this to develop it as an internal resource and vehicle for collaboration with external organizations, other regulators, both domestic and foreign. And that is so that we can all thrive and succeed. The engagement uh, prong of our effort we call guide point. That is, it serves as, a, as a, a dedicated point of contact for fintech innovators to engage with us, to learn about our regulatory framework, to understand how we go about our regulatory process, and then to obtain feedback and information about their approach to innovation. The second prong is called CFTC 2.0. And it's an extension of GuidePoint focused on understanding, testing, and adoption of new technologies for our utilization to make us a more effective uh, regulator. And third, Digitech, sorry, Digireg, 
kind of Digitech, Digireg. It's designed to support the Commission's effort to build a 21st century regulator and a regulatory framework that recognizes the impact and adopts the impact of FinTech innovation. Digireg will serve as an internal interdivisional resource to help educate our staff and track FinTech related developments and regulatory approaches. And it will further act as a hub to help us coordinate with other US and international regulatory authorities and engage with external technology focused organizations, including universities, to help drive FinTech innovation. Well, how active is our work? How active is Lab CFTC? Well, today, in fact, the members of the Lab CFTC team are in our New York City office, in fact, our office at 140 Broadway, the same place where Deloitte's uh, lab is, uh, and they're there hosting what we call lab hours. They're meeting with innovators in our dedicated office suite at 140 Broadway, talking about innovation and talking about CFTC rules and regulations. You can make an appointment with the CFT, Lab CFTC and schedule a visit and engage with us. And we'll also be conducting hours in Chicago and Silicon Valley and other places where innovation is currently taking place. Additionally, Lab Director Gorfine is looking forward to continuing collaboration efforts with the FinTech and innovation teams and other US regulators, including most, if not all, of the agencies represented in this room today. Through collaboration and the sharing of best practices, US regulators have the opportunity to enhance regulatory certainty and clarity in order to facilitate further market enhancing innovation. We believe it's important to develop this collaborative domestic regulatory network and effort. And that's why we have concerns with recommendations that we've heard recently for a new centralized innovation, a regulatory innovation office or agency we fear the creation of an additional choke point and level of bureaucracy that would thwart efficient regulation and efficient development of, of FinTech answers to market problems. Collaborations amongst regulators is not hard, but it does require some discipline. And we believe it's best attained through the collective leadership of existing regulatory agencies. Going forward, we're keen to share our learnings with our peers and all key stakeholders as we evolve in our mission to become a 21st century digital regulator for 21st century digital markets. You have a great program before you today. Uh, the discussions will largely focus on the promising highly visible innovation or set of innovations commonly known as the blockchain. Now, de definitions vary. Oversimplified conflation of concepts are common especially for digital ledger technology and virtual currencies. Still, we're interested in many, if not all, of the various components and aspects of this broad category of innovation. On the one hand, we observe the rise of private or permission shared ledger uh, systems, and we believe they hold promise in increasing operational efficiencies, decreasing transaction costs, enhancing clearing and settlement processes, facilitating regulatory reporting, and improving information capture, delivery, and analytics. On the other hand, we're also closely watching the rise of public or quasi-public blockchain systems. These are often tethered to virtual currencies that are potentially aimed at transforming payments and international money transfer, as well as powering smart or self-executing contracts, capturing digital identities, and changing the way we record and transfer title to property. These emerging systems, and I underscore that they should be viewed as systems instead of standalone products, hold substantial market enhancing promise. But they also pose new challenges for regulators who must remain proactive in ascertaining where markets are heading. For example, current enthusiasm for certain cryptocurrencies should not blind investors or regulators to the many risks of a, of a volatile new space or asset including investment risks, operational risks, and security concerns. To this last point, the increasing role played by data and the movement of data on electronic or internet platforms increases the importance of data protection and cybersecurity. These security risks will inevitably assume greater import in this new digital world. But for us in government, it's also true, as you will hear today, 
that emerging blockchain technologies can make all of us more effective and efficient at what we do. Whether it's the promise of blockchain-enabled digital identities, to improve regulatory reporting and surveillance, greater efficiency in clearing and settlement processes, or the more transparent flow of information, these innovations hold promise in benefiting the American public. It's essential that the government keep place with the marketplace. So I encourage everyone today to either begin or continue learning about fintech innovation, test and explore, and think creatively and proactively about where our markets and where our economy is heading. Innovative thinking is not exclusive to certain cities or regions in our country. May I be so bold as to say that I think it can happen right here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> in closing, the question of how U.S. policymakers and regulators approach the digitization of modern markets and our economy is critically important and it requires delicate balancing and forward thinking. To ensure vibrant, accessible, and durable financial markets, regulators must cultivate and embrace new technologies without harming innovation. There certainly must be effective safeguards of market integrity and credibility with strong rule enforcement, but those safeguards should not bar promising innovation and continuous market development. Moreover, regulators have to do our part to understand emerging technologies. That is why we're all here today. We must think outside the box about incorporating these technologies into what we do and becoming more effective at what we do. Your being here today and engaging on these topics is a very good sign that we're up to the challenge, and it's in our vital national interest that we succeed. Thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to take a few questions. I think there are microphones around. Questions for Chairman John Carl. It's early. Yeah. Threaten the captain. Don't be shot. Do you have any uh, particular uh, experiments or tests underway pursuing um, blockchain or any other forms of digital yeah. ledger technology right now? That's something we really want to do, um, and. Uh, we've been offered the opportunity to, to be nodes in some experimental blockchain developments in some core asset classes, some of the uh, critically important swaps asset classes that um, under the Dodd-Frank Act were actually required to build swap data repository systems. Um, and I think that um, participating in those experiments would be terrific. Uh, we do have some uh, uh, restrictions in our, um, uh, in our uh, uh, legal structure that prevents us from accepting outside contributions. So we're working with our oversight committees to see how we work through that. But it would be very much um, uh, in our interest to be able to do that, and we've been talking to firms about that. Let me, let me just take a moment and talk about that for a minute, because I think it's actually a, a, almost a perfect example of how blockchain technology can help uh, in a key regulatory mission. So in the 2008 financial crisis, at the heart of the crisis was a lack of visibility to uh, financial regulators into the counterparty credit exposure of one large financial institution to another financial institution in our financial markets. And there was a fear of a domino effect of a failing financial institution uh, you know, the money center bank, bringing down other large institutions because of the connectedness through their credit default swap exposures. And because there was not a clear record of those exposures, the fear of failure drove the, the crisis. And, and, and ha Professor Hal Scott at Harvard has talked about the crisis really being one of fear of contagion, not necessarily of connectedness, but really of fear, the fear of failure and the fear of one from bringing down the other. So what, what drove the fear was the opacity, the lack of visibility. And so Congress, quite rightly, in Dodd-Frank and Title VII, required that henceforth swap transactions would be reported to a central repository so the event of another crisis there could be perfect visibility into those exposures. Well, here we are, nine years after the crisis, 
uh, eight years after the Pittsburgh Accords, where, the, where that principle was set out, and, and seven years after Dodd-Frank has passed, and we still don't have that visibility into the connectedness. And it's not for a lack of trying. It's, in many ways, because we're using 20th century technological means. What, what, what are we doing? We're asking firms to report their trades to a data warehouse, and then the data warehouse pieces together that information and works with us, and then we try to, in a sense, we, first we've got to scrub the information. Everybody's providing it in a different format, so we've got to scrub it, we've got to um, uh, take out the bad data, and then create something that looks like the trading ledger of all these firms. And you know, by the time we've reassembled all the information, maybe we have a picture, maybe we don't. And since the market's a global market, we've got US data, we don't necessarily have um, Europe or Asian data. So it's, it's very much an old-fashioned you know, data assembly process. But that, where are the banks going? The banks are going to real-time trade capture. And with a blockchain, they will record that on their, on their node, and other banks will record it. And if we were there, and if this comes to a rally, we'll be able to see um, all the financial instru uh, institutions' positions in real time as they do the trade, which is what Dodd-Frank aimed to get at. And yet, we're still using a technology that is, that, is, that is 20th century. Blockchain presents enormous potential for us as a regulator to actually fulfill the mission that was set out for us statutorily, but to do it in, in a technological means that actually really gets us there. So it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity for us. Um, and we, as I said, we do have some issues on the funding side which we're working through, uh, but we very much want to participate in these, in these blockchain experiments. I think it will actually be transformative in our ability to, to, to fulfill our mission. Thank you. One more, right here. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk in kind of the blockchain community about uh, whether these cryptocurrency tokens should be uh, considered uh, uh, regulated as securities or are they uh, tokens and application of yep. commodities. Can you just talk a bit about kind of where you're thinking and what you're thinking is on that? Yeah, so, so uh, we... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let me say the question. So, so the question is, how are we thinking about uh, virtual currencies and uh, jurisdictionally, who, under 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 what federal agency do they fall, and who has jurisdiction? Um, we have a very um, uh, clear uh, statutory jurisdiction. Our, our jurisdiction is very clearly set in the Commodity Exchange Act, which is our governing. Uh, legislation and the um, uh, we, we've had to look at that a number of times in the last few years in a number of instances both in some cases of enforcement but also some cases of registration and it is the CFTC's view that um, at least in the instances where we've looked at it um, uh, uh, those uh, cryptocurrencies fall within the definition of a commodity and um, we have jurisdiction over um, uh, derivatives on commodities, and we has, have actually over, a, a degree of oversight over commodities themselves to the extent that there's a derivative on them. So um, we recently granted uh, uh, registration for Ledger X, um, a, uh, a, 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 a cryptocurrency derivative exchange, uh, simply on the basis that uh, an analysis of our statute and their application uh, led us to believe that they met the requirements for registration and registration was granted. Um, we're very careful not to get, uh, make broad statements and get uh, beyond ourselves. We look at each instance um, against our statute very carefully um, and uh, this, I think, for all of us, this is going to be an iterative process, and we're going to learn. But, but you know, we take, a, I think, a pretty straightforward view of our governing statute in terms of what is a commodity and, and what is a derivative on a commodity. And in those cases, we act. Uh, but, um, you know, we're not trying to make broad statements of applicability. It's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Excellent. So, uh, your chief is giving me the yeah. eye. I think we need to get you thank on. You thank, you thank you all very much. Thank you. Enjoy me and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. See you soon. Well, uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I have another round of applause for the Chairman. Right, guys, so now we're going to get to the, the meat of the program. I think the Chairman set us up 
uh, for a very uh, direct discussion on blockchain. We're going to talk first about blockchain and what it is. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about, the second panel will be a little bit about tangible applications. And finally, uh, there are some folks out there actually implementing blockchain now, and we're going to share some of those stories with you. So uh, with that, I'd like to invite Mark White to the stage. He's the principal innovative our chief technologist at Deloitte, very passionate about this topic, and Mark, thank you for helping us pull this together. I say thanks. Thank you. So, you, have you noticed, I've gotten several comments that we look alike. We're both tall, <laughs> red ties, good looking, <laughs> at least tall and red ties, I don't know the rest. So, um, so I appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to take a few minutes of time, and I'd like to go ahead and invite the panelists up, because I'll talk for a few minutes, but then you'll actually get some real been there, done that. So Craig Fisher and Andrew Keyes, if you all would come on up uh, and join me and join me on the, in these two middle chairs here. Um, so you, you may know Craig as the Innovation Program Manager from Department of Treasury, and he's very graciously to, uh, agreed to talk about why you might care and uh, if you haven't met Andrew, I would certainly invite you to do that. With, he's the head of global business development for Consensus, a partner of ours. Uh, then you'll see them here at the, at the show. So I, I, I want to start by talking about um, what is blockchain. And it's interesting. There's a, there's a, how many of you would consider yourself on a scale of one, which as I just heard about it and came to the conference, to 10? which is I actually have a business, I have mined Bitcoin, or I've built a solution or a blockchain system that's solving mission problems today. So how many of you are on sort of the five to one side? Yes, and six to 10 side? Uh, so good, so did you didn't raise your hand for six to 10? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thus the dilemma of, a, of an event like this, a forum like this, because there is a, there is a sort of, 101, what is it and why might you care, all the way to the 501 or 5000 level of how do I optimize to execute in a marketplace with evolving regulatory stance, et cetera, like we heard from the chairman. Great remarks, by the way. So I'm going to tend a little bit towards the, this, this side of the spectrum about what is it and why you might care. I'm going to guard myself and my colleagues are going to guard me as well from slipping into the techno babble. Uh, I'm a computer scientist and mathematician, and so the, some of the underlying techniques and technologies to blockchain as a systems protocol are quite interesting to both a mathematician and to a computer scientist. However, in the how do I make it do something good for my business, for my mission, for my constituents, it actually, it's just, it's just underneath the covers, and it should remain underneath the covers. In the late 90s, uh, we were having conversations like this about what is the internet? What is the World Wide Web? And why might you care? And people wanted to talk about HTML coding and, then it, and, and you know what, it just didn't matter, did it? I mean, there, it mattered to some people because we did it for a living, right? But in point of fact, what mattered was the transformation of information delivery and ultimate economic transaction in this now digital, we would say, or virtual commerce, global commerce. I believe that there's the same play for blockchain, um, um, Haley, do we have the, the slide? You have in front of you a big piece of paper that looks like this. And so I would invite you to sort of look at that as we talk. Um, I say blockchain, you say, first thing comes to your mind, blockchain, Bitcoin, blockchain, Bitcoin, blockchain, Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? It's a good chant. It's not unreasonable because in fact, Bitcoin was the foundational use case around which all of this protocol and all of these capabilities were brought together. Just like um, the efficient delivery and sharing of scientific papers was the initial use case around which the World Wide Web and hypertext, uh, hypertext market language originated, right? So it's just, so I, would you say that the internet today is about scientific paper sharing? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. If it weren't for Amazon uh, and Prime, I'd be, you know, I'd be naked and sitting on the floor at home. It, it, there's just <laughs> nothing in the house. So, so we say blockchain to Bitcoin today because it was a foundational. And by the way, the idea of cryptocurrency and non-fiat currencies are interesting and powerful, and you'll hear some about that today. In fact, the chairman's, the chairman's characterization of these currencies as a commodity um, speaks to that. What I hope is that, that when we're done today, I say uh, blockchain, you say distributed consensus ledger. 
Now, it's not quite as catchy as blockchain Bitcoin, blockchain Bitcoin, but it is a distributed consensus ledger, a digital distributed consensus ledger, if you'd like. Right? So this is, I'm looking at the sort of upper left, uh, upper, yes, upper left of this, right? What is it? It's a ledger. How many of you have posted ledgers? Some of you are old enough. Eric, I think you're old enough to have posted a ledger. <laughs> right? Right, 13 column pegboard on the green. What did you write into a ledger? I wrote a transaction about an amount for an account for a period for a transaction. Or I wrote perhaps a statistical, I wrote a piece of information in. I wrote um, an, an entry of a company or a person into my ecosystem of trade and commerce, of business and social. I wrote stuff that needed to be remembered and kept. I wrote a ledger. Now, the interesting thing about ledger, general ledger, accounts payable, fixed asset ledgers, is there's always been an owner. Because there had to be a source of truth, and if I wanted to manage the source of truth effectively, I had to have an owner, a place where the buck stopped. What happened when these guys started to solve this problem that turned into Bitcoin was they didn't like that, that central control. They wanted to be able to transact and have a ledger, a, a system of record, source of truth ledger that was managed simultaneously, owned simultaneously by multiple people in the ecosystem. It is a distributed ledger. What can you do with a distributed ledger? A lot of interesting things, and you'll hear about them today. Now, what's the problem? Because there's some good stuff. As a technologist, if, my co if copies of the ledger are distributed all over the place and one of them is destroyed, made inaccessible, one of them is hacked, made incorrect, then I can self-heal because there are multiple copies of the ledger, each perfectly valid, each the source of truth system of record. If I'm doing something here and something in Kuala Lumpur, and I'm worried about the lag time of communications, again, as a technologist, great stuff, right? I have a distributed ledger. But what's the problem? The problem is if we decide that we're going to do something together, we're going to be the ecosystem for the ledger, and each of us can have our own copy and, and, and source of truth, how do we make sure that it's just one? That, in fact, truth is truth, that my truth and Jose's truth are not different. And that's consensus, the consensus protocol, distributed consensus ledger. That's what it is. It's just a ledger. And when a group of people, a group of companies, a collection of organizations or associations want to come together into an ecosystem and do some kind of business or social activity together, and they need a ledger, then blockchain represents a type of system to satisfy that need. <coughs> What kind of problems does it solve? All right, so now I'm looking up here on the three blue bubbles. What kinds of problems does it solve? Well, there are three, we believe, that are just sort of the, the classic use cases. One, it's record keeping. It's a place to write it down and have a system of record. So, um, are you married? When you got married, there was, uh, Alex, there was a, a marriage certificate filed, right? Right, so somebody filled out a form, somebody witnessed the form, somebody actually sort of sealed the form. You got a copy of the form, or your wife got a copy of the form. Where's the actual form? In the office. No, it's in somebody's, well, were you married here in the U.S.? No. Uh, well, okay, I don't know. So, uh, you know, you've got to pick on people you know, because if you ask if you're married, it would be an, 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 an awkward thing. But in the U.S., it's in some county records office. When you have children, you have a birth certificate, the same process occurs. Where's the actual record? In some county records office. Your, your driver's permit, your, your professional licensing, your land records, bloody um, uh, mortgage insurance, right? All of those things, when people do the mortgage, the, 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 the check on mortgages, make sure that the land is clear, the ownership is clear, you can hold the mortgage, or the bank can hold the mortgage on your behalf, right? Those are all record systems that are inherently inefficient because they are paper-based, they are not digital. Neither are they distributed, they're just ledgers. So recordation, which happens to be, by the way, a fundamental function of government, is well suited to use cases for blockchain, recordation, value exchange, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm compelled to point out not just money, right? Not just monetary value, but things of value. So Chairman Giancarlo's characterization of it as a commodity 
um, is quite good. Um, Andrew will talk about tokenization, and I don't want to steal that because it's a great spiel. Tokenization of things. I want to do value exchange. How do I do that? Well, I have to be able to trust the person with whom I'm exchanging. Well, what if there is no trust? Blockchain Bitcoin, blockchain Bitcoin, because there's money, there's a there's liquid asset being exchanged, and there's zero knowledge, zero trust, right? So a ledger to record and a consensus mechanism to assure that all who choose to participate in that ecosystem, once the consensus mechanism runs, I'm willing to live with the truth that was posted. Right? Exchange of value. Currency, art, diamonds. Um, gentlemen, when you buy a diamond for your fiance, now there's actually a serial number micro engraved on the girdle of the diamond. Did you know this? I did not know this, but it's true. And the serialization of those diamonds allows me to look at the entire supply chain from the mine to her finger to understand that there is trust that that diamond, in fact, was legitimately mined, was legitimately marketed, is in fact the diamond you thought you paid for when she takes it and get it, gets it cleaned. In fact, that same diamond comes back. Where can that exchange of value and recordation of authenticity or provenance occur? On the blockchain. Recordation, exchange of value, Third broad use case, and this is the one I think, Eric, that we see the most often in commerce now, is the idea of um, smart contracts. So here's the cool thing. You look at this ledger, and I can write a transaction to the ledger. I can write a piece of data. I can write an, an executed transaction, a, st a, a statistic. It turns out into the blockchain ledger, in the ether, notice I didn't use the C word, cloud, right? In the blockchain ledger, you can write a program. You can actually write a program that's a little, a little business rule set that runs on the contents of the ledger. It's like settlement transactions, right? We're going to write a collection of transactions and eventually they settle to a net effect. So I can write a program to the ledger. And that program is going to be a set of rules or contract that runs as the ledger gets posted. It too goes through the same test of veracity or consensus for truth that a, tra a financial transaction or a recordation transaction. So once it's posted, it's indelible, right? It's permanent. You can't, remember you write the ledgers in ink, you don't write them in pencil because you're not supposed to erase the mistake and change it from 10,000 to 1,000. Right? You're supposed to post an adjusting entry. Right? That's how it works. That's how it works on the blockchain. So once I've written this contract, it will run on behalf of the parties to the contract. Interesting. So what has the blockchain then become? A non-human trustee. Right? It actually disintermediates processes. So um, Forex, foreign exchange, is, a, is a, a financial operation that is quite expensive. There's a lot of friction from the amount of intermediaries that are used to manage the lack of trust between foreign exchange. At large scale, by the way, this is billions of dollars a day and week. And so if I use the blockchain, which in fact is happening with a small set of, um, of large global money banks and community, to do this foreign exchange, I get rid of the middleman and the overhead cost of that goes from, I don't know, from 2% as high as 6% in, the, in a, a global transaction for, for uh, less traded currencies down to, we're told less than 2%, we believe almost as, as little as half a percent overhead cost to run the trustee function. Now, when you're moving billions of dollars, right, and from 2% to a half percent, let's just choose the, or from 6% to 2%, it's a lot of money, right? makes a difference. What is blockchain? It's a ledger. It's a ledger that's distributed and source of truth and, and veracity is managed through a consensus mechanism. It is a distributed consensus ledger. What is it for? It's for recording stuff in the ecosystem of people or organization or companies that have decided to get together around it. Recordation. To exchange value as much as that needs to occur. Not just currency or liquid value but commodities or even illiquid value. And it has the ability to program the contracts amongst the parties in the ecosystem in a way that reduces human trustee overhead cost and friction and increases an incredible amount of veracity. Um, by the way, caveat emptor, you know what that means, right? Buyer beware. Today, if you write a contract onto one of the dominant blockchains, 
make sure that you check your side of the contract because once that, pu that puppy's written, it's written, right? And if you made a mistake, with great power goes great responsibility. Thank you, Stan Lee, Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Come on, guys, right? <laughs> right? All right, what is blockchain? Why might you care? I will point and not, not elaborate on at the bottom here is a set of tests for the idea of how do I, if I, I have an idea, I have an idea about what I might do, why I might care, what I might do with it, how can I test my idea? We call it a use case, right? That would be the, the computer geek guy's version of this. I have a use case, how do I test it? And our suggestion to you is that you've got to look at the business case overall, the technical feasibility, and the blockchain viability. Um, what Eric and, and, and Jose and I know is that um, somebody says, can we do it with blockchain? And our first answer ought to be, can't you just do it with a database? Can't you just do it with a web post? Right? Can't you just do it with an existing technology? Because technology for technology's sake is costly in the long term. Overpromise, underdeliver is a bad thing, and that's something about which we're guarding today. Right. Good? Comments, questions? What I'd like to do is I'd like to sit down with these guys here. Um, so we have been there, done that, both on the uh, industry side and the government side. And, and Andrew, just um, improve my introduction of you. Give us a little background about sure. you. Sure. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everybody who is now a blockchain geek, tell, tell why that's funny. So Satoshi Nakamoto was a pseudonymous, or is 